News First, Newsline Prime with Araz Shaukat Ali. And a very good evening to you. This is Newsline Prime, live as always from the News First studios in Dawson Street in Colombo. And this evening, uh, following on um, President Sirisena's uh, address to Parliament and on other matters, we've got uh, veteran politician Mr. Vasudeva Nanekara with us right here in the studio. Very good evening to you, Mr. Vasudeva. Good evening, good evening. And uh, many thanks for coming on the program, right on time. Um, you were not kept waiting. Very good. Now then, the President, President Maitripala Sivisena, has had a lot to say about the Constitutional hmm. Council. Hmm. How valid is what he's had to say? Well, the fact they are out, what he said. Yeah. Uh, the grievances of judges about how they have been overlooked in the appointments to the Supreme Court, mm. to the Court of Appeal, and even about the promotions from their district court positions to Court of Appeal positions mm. or High Court positions. All these have not been ventilated anywhere. Mm. They have had no opportunity except to come and complain to the President that they are being overlooked and they have no right of appeal, they have no trade unions, they have no way of ventilating their grievances. So the president really became more convinced mm. when they came out with these complaints and grievances. And he looked into it more carefully and he said, I have recommended, mm. but you have rejected to the Constitutional Council. Yeah. But you didn't say why you were rejecting. You did not explain why you refuse. The same problem, same crisis is uh, hitting the Indian Supreme Court, mm -hmm. as you might have noticed, yeah. about the nominations and the selections. Yeah. Because ultimately we are all human. Yeah. And there are human prejudices. Yeah. And there are definite uh, uh, choices that people make. Yes. And when they do make choices, there is a personal element all the time. Indeed. And therefore, it always leaves the other yeah. with the grievance, uh, the other with uh, discrimination, as he perceives. So this is what the President explained. I'll tell you later mm -hmm. what he said further. Now then, um, is the Constitutional Council under obligation to explain the rationale of their decision? That is the normal thing that follows after decision making. You either explain why you made the decision, that's what judges do. Hmm. And uh, if, you, if you reject yeah. the nomination, nomination comes from the president. Yeah. So they have to tell the president why they were unable to make that choice. Yeah. So that the president will be informed how he should nominate. Mm. Otherwise he is nominating, they are rejecting. Right. So, <clears throat> so you, you feel that um, there is uh, some form of obligation on the part of the co uh, council to, to explain the rationale. Firstly, they are under obligation to explain it to the parliament. Right. Parliament is responsible for their election mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. selection. Mm. The Parliament is ultimately the body which will go into the matters of the judiciary as well as all the other institutions yeah. which come under the government. Right. So therefore the Constitutional Council is not above the Parliament. Yeah. Constitutional Council is subject to the Parliament. Mm -hmm. Parliament has the right to ask. But the parliament is not being accounted for or accounted to by the Constitutional Council as they ought to do. Leave alone the president. The president is the one who nominates. He too enjoys sovereignty of the people being elected by the people countrywide. Mm. And thereafter he nominates a person as for a promotion or for a position which are prescribed there. And then the Constitutional Council cannot, uh, without assigning a reason or without due consideration, just choose 
to reject a person right. or to appoint another person about the question of the attorney general's appointment, yeah. IGP's appointment. All these matters are today smoking with the complaints that are underlying. <clears throat> but this is four years, but, but this is four years into the into this government. Why now? Why only now? The, the fact of the matter is that the President and the Prime Minister were in agreement yeah. to have a national government. So they continued with their national government for three years. When they broke up, yeah. they were not under obligation to one another. And thereafter, the president thought correctly that he could come out with his grievances, his grievances about his complaints, about his, uh, what you call, uh, observations about how things have been so going on. So what you're saying is that this isn't quite kiss and tell, but this is post-divorce. Well, you could say that it is so, but the important thing is politically. Yeah. These are not personal relationships. That's right. These are political relationships. So political relationships, when they terminate, yeah. they naturally So what I mean then is up. that this is... Uh, is after, we, the or, or after the termination. After the termination. So the president is... Uh, not breaking any uh, sort of unwritten rules, but he is being quite open about uh, the, what was in he, the past. I think I haven't seen a president or a prime minister more open than him. Right. When he asked Rania to come and swear as the prime minister, yeah. take his oath as the prime minister the after the, the change of government, yeah. he told him uh, quite a few things yeah. against him yeah. in his presence yeah. just before affirming him there and was, there that was is the openness there was some discomfort <laughs> there was embarrassment discomfort yes. and uh, I think that was the worst personal crisis he went through for but a moment but I did see some of the ministers who were who accompanied uh, <laughs> who were present at that meeting uh, some with their spouses yes. um, who I, I thought that they might get up and go I thought one would rise to say, Your Excellency, we have come to affirm yeah. not to listen to your charges against us. Yeah. Please carry on with your obligations. I thought somebody had the guts to say that. Were they all spineless then? They all sat and listened bitterly. <laughs> was, it, was the lure of the gold so great that they <laughs> that they decided to listen to the uh, hard facts. I suppose being that's another out. way to look at it. Yes. We Come what to, may, yeah. no matter what, I am going to be the Prime Minister. And this is more important than anyway. all what I have to gulp down and digest in the form of decent abuse. <laughs> right. Well <laughs> Um, now then, the president was also, he said that the appointments of the um, Attorney General yeah. and the IGP, yeah. and he said especially the IGP, yeah. uh, was not ethical. He said those appointments were not made on the basis of a recommendation that I have made as my priority. Mm -hmm. They didn't care to ask my priorities. So, do you think that in all this, they, they just sort of mistook uh, the executive president to be just some other person who, some sort of titular figurehead who could be played around with? I think they were, they were of the view that the president will play ball with them. I see. Because they gave him all the necessary votes to become the president mm. and therefore 
he is obliged to uh, bear with them, no matter what they say, do or think. That's how they went on for about one year. Mm. Then after one year, things were not the same and frictions began. And ultimately, the termination, end of three years. Now then, um, as you know, on Newsline Prime, we do encourage our listeners, viewers, to, to us send us SMSs directly, straight here, 0772 300 305. Yeah. Kindly don't call it, just send us an SMS. And uh, here we go, here's one which I'll take. Um, since the time of C.J. Sarat Silva, who got some questionable judges to resign, no such judges have been removed. At least four of the High Court judges by passed by the Constitutional Council are questionable. That is common knowledge amongst practicing lawyers. I couldn't follow the first part of the question. It says that uh, well, Sarat Silva, that when Sarat he was Silva CJ, says that he was CJ. He got some questionable judges to resign. Yes. No such questionable judges have been removed now. At least four of the High Court judges are bypassed, uh, who have been bypassed by the Constitutional Council, are questionable. That is common knowledge amongst practicing lawyers. Yes. The stature of the CJ matters in this. Right. Uh, the CJ, if it was Deb, or if it was Nalin Pereira, uh, they have to be of the uh, strong kind in mm. order to take steps to ask the judges who are found to be guilty or suspected of uh, bad conduct, misconduct to resign. Mm -hmm. So, if the CJ, the given CJ is, we have had several CJs thereafter, mm. if the given CJ is not of that uh, strong will, uh, conviction, mm. and uh, the kind of uh, outlook in order to go into these matters in that way that Sarat Silva did, I can understand that. I see. Now then, is it... Some people question the, the, the equity of uh, the president or any other official for that matter uh, to be openly critical of, uh, let's say, let's, for in this case, let's talk about the appointment of the IGP. Is it fair? Well, is it fair game? Uh, anything is uh, ultimately fair or not fair mm. in all the circumstances of the case. Yeah. In all the circumstances of this case, I believe there is a justification for the president to raise issues about some of the appointments of the CC. Constitutional Council, where he had not given his uh, full approval. Mm. What I mean by full approval is, he has to send a name, they will not appoint, then mm. he has to send another name, mm. or two names, then they appoint one of them. Mm. So he may have, you may say that he had given his semi-approval, not his full approval. Mm. So therefore he can always feel that he is entitled to make a comment, yeah. critical comment, on what ultimately came about. I want to take you to something else. Uh, we were treated to the information that the, mm, uh, the Parliament passed themselves a, a significant uh, a benefit, if you like, or significant service, and that is uh, 100 million rupees for new elevators. Now then, several things come to my mind. First of all, this is the same parliament, is it not, that has frustrated the holding 
of provincial council elections, which are 18 months at least overdue. And yet, when it comes to their safety, their benefits, something that is of use to them, then very conveniently they all get together and pass this thing in a record few days. Hmm. My comment. Your comment. The parliament is made up of a government and opposition. Yeah. In few instances, the parliament has the opposition and the government coming up with the same complaint hmm. or the identical complaint or they join in making uh, noise about an issue yeah. and lift matter is one of those because all got stuck in the lift. That brings me to my second point on the on the lift story. It can looks, I, it seems, please, can you, I finish? Please, yes. And then on matters which are not common to both, yeah. like the provincial council elections, yeah. then the government makes the decision and those who are with the government fall behind the government in denying the people of the right of their franchise. Then it is not the parliament, it is the government. But in this instance, the government and the opposition together agree that the lift must not get stuck. Brings me to another point about this elevator story. One is you say that where both sides have common ground, then things get passed quickly. That's in essence what you're saying. Yeah. We, we can understand that. But shouldn't the people's interest be common ground to course, all parties? Of course, of course. I, I, I totally agree with you and therefore I have no hesitation to uh, join you in throwing the indictment at the face of the government. Now then, I have to ask this other question. The elevator that got stuck with 12 people in is only designed to have six. So either the parliamentarians can't read or they have no respect for what's written down. Notices have been there. Mm. The practice of more than six going in the lift also has been there. So they have been continuing for some time because they thought these notices are ultimately only cautioning. But in fact, that they could carry more than six and that's how they believe. Anyway. Were you one of them who got stuck? No, I'm not. Right. Okay, carry on. Then. <laughs> Very curiously, I decided to take the steps that day. There you go. This is my third question. <laughs> Why vote for 100 million? Why can't they... Whilst they're fixing walk it, just up the steps. walk up and down the steps. I think I agree with you. Uh, I will go back to Parliament and make that point yes. at the first instance available. Yeah. That we should be using the steps and not and using and the it's elevator. Good, and it's good exercise anyway. Also saving electricity, power. Oh, come on, Mr. Vah. So I don't think that the bulk of the majority of your colleagues in Parliament think like that. It may not be, may not be, but objectively, I was thinking yeah. that we have to look at so many sides to it. But there will be some who are not able to climb the steps. For them, the lift must be available. And for the others who, well, you can't say that also because everywhere there is an elevator now. So you can't tell the MPs, don't have elevator in the parliament. You know, if you go well, to I, think, I, I, think I, our, I think our problem, Mr. Vasudeva, is this, that whilst we don't really begrudge these elected officials, and some of them are appointed, um, their benefits, we do rather expect the favour, if you like, to be returned. The people would like, once in a way, for parliamentarians to deliver what they promised, not just to come and see the people only during elections. Yes. A lady uh, just outside Kurunagal, an elderly lady, uh, asked me whilst I went on this government uh, thing some time back, she said, just wait, I'll tell you what I'll do if and when the parliamentarians come. 
So she came back with a big broom, big stick. She said, I'll hit them with this if they come here before they fix the road. Do you, I think that, don't you think that's reflective of most people's frustration? Well, I, I wouldn't want to blame the individual parliamentarians more mm. than what I would do regarding the non-availability of funds mm. with the treasury, which ultimately is the responsibility of the government. It's a combination of all these. <laughs> you have moved me to laughter. What do you mean non-availability of funds? Non-availability of funds, there'd be at least 20 odd billion rupees more available in the kitty had it not been for one Arjuna Mahindran. Or have you forgotten? No, I haven't forgotten. I quite agree with you. I see the point you're making. The government on the one hand had allowed the slipping away of funds by collusion, connivance and sharing the loot. Yeah. And on the other hand, the government, uh, I say that the government hasn't enough money in the treasury, which is also true. And these are both true. Letting Arjuna Mahendran uh, rant. <laughs> I'm getting a message from a viewer who's asking you a question. He's asking whether you feel that any of the money that has been spent by this parliament, has it been put to good use? Yes. Can you I tell think. us what? Yesterday, uh, I was sitting in the public accounts committee mm. and we were examining the motor commissioner's department. Mm. And we found that some of the money voted and some of the money revenue that is earned by the motor commissioner's department is put to good use in digitalizing the systems in order to find the offenders who recurrently uh, commit offenses mm -hmm. and to have it uh, linked up between the police, the commissioners and also other institutions of the government. So this involves a lot of money and whether the amount that is intended to be spent is too much is another matter. But the purpose that it is serving is good. That is in not reduced the amount of accidents and callous driving. Thank you. And uh, on that note, we'll go for a quick break, short one. Don't go away. After all, this is Newsline Prime. News first, Newsline Prime with Araz Shaukatali. And welcome back to Newsline Prime. We're in conversation with Mr. Vasudeva Nanyakara. Now then, Mr. Vasudeva, shall we go down, um, not down memory lane, but down the present route? Uh, and rather like um, Sri Lankan Airlines, which over the last nine months, or in this, uh, since the, um, uh, the end of the Rajapaksa era, Although they uh, continuously pointed out various things, the losses um, have been, the most recent losses, been up to 24 billion, with a B, 24 billion rupees. Now they promised us good governance and they promised us a professional team to run Sri Lankan Airlines. They said that a planter didn't know how to do it. Well, boy oh boy, what about these so-called professionals? Are they professionals or are they people who are what we call peps, politically exposed persons, related or friends of uh, higher politicians like Soren Ratwata, Ajit Dias. They ran Sri Lankan Airlines for whenever it is. They, the, the cancellations paid out is over 150 million US dollars. All this done on the back of what? Where is the professionalism in running an airline with a 24 billion rupee loss? Right, now that's, that's, that's one question there. Then I noticed that in Parliament, uh, the Prime Minister was asked about this Madush matter. And nowhere in that 
response of the Prime Minister, did the Prime Minister acknowledge that there is no valid extradition treaty between the UAE and Sri Lanka? And yes, the Prime Minister may well point out that there is a difference between extradition and deportation. But why did he not point out that there is no extradition treaty? Why are all these people wasting our money, going up, down and sideways? How do these two questions or statement and this last question relate to one another? I'm asking you whether the... The Sri Lankan the, and Mihinne Alliance matter is, is, is a lack of professionalism. Lack That's of professionalism, lack of honesty, excessive corruption, all these can be added up into the losses that it has incurred. I am not going to be a defender of corruption, mm. though it might have happened uh, under the regime of our Mahinda Rajapaksha. Yes, but this is the whole point. That's why I mentioned specifically that this is something that's happened within the period of so-called good governance. Yes, three years. Right? Yes, it, they came to put right the wrongs, but they have continued with the wrongs with the thunder. I, I, I have heard that they've actually increased it. That is what I mean, with the thunder. You asked what was the link between this Sri Lankan main and question and Madhush. Yeah. Again, it is a lack of professionalism and, oh, yes. and, and, and an utter lack of truthfulness. Because just because he wasn't asked specifically about extradition doesn't mean that he mustn't disclose the facts fully. Why are our officials prone to be economical with the truth? Truth is uh, uncomfortable when the next questions are put to him. Isn't it true that Madush cannot be extradited in that way yes, because cannot. there is no extradition treaty. Yeah. But there can be always an arrangement between the two states about the offender fugitive to have him deported even if there is no extradition. Extradition comes in where we make the demand and we have a right to make a demand. Correct. Uh, in these circumstances I believe the two governments can come to an understanding. Similarly with Arjun Mahendra. But no initiative has been taken understandably by the Prime Minister to do so. Why understandably? Because everybody knows in this country it is public knowledge that the Prime Minister and Arjun Mahendran were very close friends and Arjun Mahendran appointed by him, taking full responsibility for him. And all what happened thereafter about the central bank, what you call the looting of the central bank, happened between them, between them. You... And this is further confirmed by the fact that the COP committee was manipulated by the Prime Minister in order to have the uh, inquiry, in order to have the inquiry. And you talk about the footnotes, are you? Yes, I mean about the footnotes and also changing the composition of the yes, he got one, committee. He got to... one of his own men instead of a person who wouldn't rise to defend him. Yeah. And therefore, it is public knowledge that he was involved in this entire scam. La last and final question, Mr. Vasudevananya Kara. Do you believe the Prime Minister when he says he has no knowledge as to where Arjun Mahendran is? <laughs> I believe the contrary. I believe the contrary when he says so. So in plain speak, Vasudeva Nanekara, Member of Parliament, yes. does not believe the Prime Minister's version when he says he does not know where <laughs> Arjun Mahendran is. That will be a bit of a, a bit of humour for our spectators. But can you not answer the question? Do you believe the Prime Minister when he says that he knows, he does not know where Arjuna Mahendra is. I'll say it in simple words. Yes. He's a liar. Vasudeva Nanakara, thank you very much for being on Newsline Prime.
Mm -hmm. I appreciate it. We'll see you hopefully on Newsline uh, on the morning of the 27th of February, which is precisely four years since Sri Lanka and the, its people were taken on one almighty big ride. It's called the Bond Gate Scam. Join Newsline on Wednesday morning for a Newsline special to mark the fourth anniversary of the greatest fraud ever perpetrated on the people of Sri Lanka. Not my words, those are the words described, uh, the, describing the bond by the Attorney General's Department at the Presidential Commission of Inquiry. Vasudevan Anagra, thank you. Have a thank great you. evening. Thank and you. the same to you, you uh, dear us. listeners. And good night and God bless. News First, Newsline Prime with Faraz Shaukatali.